Thanks, Alex. This, uh, I am Doug Self, and again, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, Computational Genomics Corps, um, and here to tell you about a personalized medicine project I've been in, engaged in there. When you hear personalized medicine, your mind may go to things like this. Uh, this is a Swedish doctor who, with approval for, case, for patients who had really no other options existing, has taken their own stem cells and grown uh, new tracheas for them in the lab using bioengineered scaffolding. That, that may be what you think of when you hear personalized medicine, and that, that does come under that umbrella for sure. Um, but that's not the kind of thing that I want to tell you about today. Um, that's, that's exciting technology. I think during a lot of your lifetimes, maybe all of ours, it'll be pretty common. But it, kind of an aside related to organs and growing organs. Um, I was at the cons last year, been around this year. Um, you may want to keep track of guys who are doing work like, work like this. They're growing new livers, and some of you may be in the market for those. So. <laughs> But back to our story. Um, it's a different kind of personalized medicine. I started at Vanderbilt a little over 12 years ago now. And one of the first projects I was involved in was part of what they call the Pharmacogenomics Research Network. And this was a multi-site consortium. Uh, included places like Northwestern, Stanford, Harvard, St. Jude's in Memphis. And they were all looking at pharmacogenomic impact, which pharmacogenomics is the, the study of drug gene interactions. So how does someone's particular genetic makeup affect how they're going to metabolize and respond to a drug? Now, the Vanderbilt site was looking in particular at uh, drugs being used for cardiac arrhythmia therapy. So one of the drugs being studied was warfarin. Um, the brand name that you'll most commonly see for warfarin if I can make it move, is Coumadin. Um, warfarin is an anticoagulant, and it was developed in the 1940s and had a very interesting original purpose. Does anyone in here know? You got it. Rat poison. That brings up a question, right? Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on the subject, but as I understand it, there was a U.S. Army soldier who attempted suicide using warfarin. Uh, a known antidote saved his life, and somehow observations of his condition and his response led to interest in warfarin as a drug. And I'll leave a little gap there for you between that and how they wound up prescribing it, but that's, that's how I understand it. So what, is, what does warfarin do? Well, as I said, it's an anticoagulant, which means it thins your blood. Um, common use is to treat atrial fibrillation, which is the most common cardiac arrhythmia seen in, in clinical settings. Uh, <clears throat> now, when you're prescribing warfarin as a provider, you need to watch someone's what's called INR. That's the International Normalized Range, and it's a measure of the blood's resistance to clotting. Um, so the physician has to watch this, and they, they use a titration process when they're prescribing warfarin to a new patient. So if you're starting warfarin, you're probably going to go in at the beginning, go in every day, and have blood drawn. And they're going to see, OK, what, what's their INR after using this dosage? So they're going to move your dosage up and down until they get you where they want you, which is the therapeutic range. So a, a common therapeutic range, this varies some depending on a particular patient, their condition, you know, maybe if they've got valve replacements, different things, that it might move, but a common value that they would want, want you between would be two and three. Now, if your INR is below two, you're at a greater risk of clotting. Clotting, bad, blood clot goes to the lungs, goes to the brain, you know, bad things happen. If it's above three, well, now you're at a greater risk of bleeding. So you bleed out internally. So obviously, it's something they have to watch carefully. So 
What were they studying at Vanderbilt in, in 2001, 2002? Well, their hypothesis, hypothesis about warfarin was that they could find a correlation between genetic variations in people and what their therapeutic warfarin dose was. So they go into the warfarin clinic, they capture DNA from those patients, and then keep a history also of how that patient's INR moves on the doses they prescribe. <clears throat> and then go back and analyze that data looking for correlations. Well, over time, a consortium of researchers from you know, many institutions compare notes and they, they come to a consensus. These specific ger genetic variations affect how a patient responds to warfarin, and we think we can improve the prescription process. So fast forward a decade, and now they've established these links. Recommendations have been published. Hey, patients with this genotype, you can change their dosage in this way. There's just one little problem, and that is your doctor doesn't typically have your genotypes when he's prescribing warfarin to you. And there enters PREDICT. PREDICT is the pharmacogenomic resource for enhanced decisions in care and treatment, your standard SLA seven letter acronym. Um, <laughs> so it was a clinical program to introduce genotyping for patients as something of a routine practice. First of its kind in the, the country as I understand it. Um, and this was actually launched in 2010 in the clinic. So it was designed to improve patient outcomes by, by helping physicians better choose doses, in, in some cases choose different medications in a way that was very, you know, very personalized to that patient. And it would give them inf information on their genotypes and also give the physician in information on the implications of those genotypes for the particular drug that they're prescribing at the point of care. So it was something of a novel program. Well, in addition to warfarin, what other drugs are, are they doing this with? Well, one was clopidogrel. This was actually the first drug that was launched in, in PREDICT. Uh, this is a, another blood thinner, but it's used most commonly in patients that have had uh, cardiac catheterization and a stent placement. They're almost always sent home in Plavix, but uh, patients with certain genotypes don't respond as well to Plavix, so they need a different dose. And then there are others who simply won't metabolize it at all, and they need a different drug. Well, if, if you need Plavix, but your genotype doesn't allow you to, to metabolize it, you've got a problem, right? If you're, if you're only, only getting Plavix. So that was a, a great thing. They've, you know, they estimate a number of lives have been saved by patients that they were able to, to contact them and say, hey, we need to change your drug. because you, you're, you're not getting the benefit you need here. Also, simvastatin, simv <clears throat> that's a hard word right now, simvastatin. Uh, this is a cholesterol treatment, and also here, some genotypes need an alternate drug or a different dose. Tacrolimus is an anti-rejection drug. It's used commonly in kidney uh, transplant patients, and it can also help guide the dosage that they need. Thiopurines, uh, these are used to treat several kinds of patients, autoimmune disorders like Crohn's disease, uh, sometimes any uh, organ transplant recipients, and also ALL, which is acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And it's another one where dosages are, are moved by genotypes. I also want to mention, this is a, a separate program at Vanderbilt, but something similar in the cancer space. There's a, a different program that's um, it's got different sponsors and oversight, but it's it's performed in the same laboratory using a different genotyping platform of, for necessary reasons. They need, they need different data than PREDICT does. But they're actually genotyping biopsy malignant tissue, and then that enables them to then select better chemotherapy agents for, with the tumor's genotypes in mind. Because you know, oftentimes, a cancer patient, they'll go on chemotherapy, they try one agent, oh, that didn't work, we're going to try this one now. And that, and that ravages your body when you're, it may not be killing the tumor, but it's killing you, right? So this lets them really improve the care of cancer patients by giving them the most effective drug they can. 
Um, so that's a, a separate program, but also exciting. Uh, a couple other things that are important to note. Um, all these drugs that are used in PREDICT, there's scientific consensus around how particular genotypes affect a patient's response to that drug. Um, there are additional candidate drugs. There's a, a team at Vanderbilt that's continually reviewing scientific research publishings and looking for new drugs that they can bring online in the program, looking to, to do this with more things. Um, lastly, and most importantly, I'm a software guy. Um, don't make any medical decisions based on anything I've said. I am not a doctor. So, okay, so the, let's do a little overview of the PREDICT program, how it works. It, it all begins with an order entry in uh, systems for the patient. I listed a couple up here. There's actually more in use at Vanderbilt. Uh, these are applications that, by which an order may come in. There, it depends on whether you're an inpatient, an outpatient, you're in the clinic, you're in a remote clinic, all different ways this can happen. But the, the practitioner creates an order for PREDICT, and which triggers blood specimens blood specimen collection. So the phlebotomist is there, patients in front of them, they, got, they need all this test, I'll predict, okay, I need a purple top tube of blood for that. They're gonna draw that blood. And the order and the tube arrive in the, the MDL lab, as we call it, and there'll be, there'll be a paper order actually with the tube in a little plastic sleeve, and they can start their work. So they're gonna do DNA extraction on that blood, prepare it for genotyping to put on the instrument, and then they're gonna do their QC on the the results. Um, from there, it goes to clinical informatics, where they have a rules processing engine that will look at the pr patient's particular genotypes and determine what known DGIs fall out of that. So a DGI is a drug gene interaction. And all those DGIs that are calculated using those rules will go into the patient's medical record. Um, so they'll be there, A is just data. Um, so a physician could go and look for those things. But beyond that, the most important thing is this, the CDS, or clinical decision support. So if, when a physician goes to prescribe warfarin or Plavix or something else that this patient has these DGIs in their record, it will, they'll get a pop-up essentially on the screen that says, hey, this patient is known to have this genotype, which causes this result in their response to this drug, you know, consider adjusting their dose this way, consider this other medication. So that, that decision support is there. The physician's free to use that, ignore it. You know, it, that's, that's left up to the, to the provider. But that's the, the critical piece of this. Now, all these clinical informatics pieces in blue, that's kind of over the wall for me, if you will. Um, that's not the part of the system that I work on. That's, that's done in the clinical informatics group. They're a, a big enterprise Java team, large team. They've written this homegrown uh, EMR system, electronic medical record, that uh, is a very large and complex piece of software when you think that one system supports um, you know, your basic medical clinic users, all your inpatient and outpatient uh, situations. That's a, that's a complex piece of software, but that's all over the wall from what we're looking at today. So, <clears throat> the order entry in green, the blood specimen in red, those are data and physical inputs respectively into the lab. And then the lab, this is where really the application that I've been working on the last three years is, is used. So, It's August of 2010, and it's time to code. But there's not much time to code. Because <laughs> as I said, it's August, and we had, by the time all the discussions that involved us began like eight months prior to this, by the time all the requirements kind of crystallized and we knew this is what we have to build, there's a four to five weeks. I've kind of tried to forget this period, but it, it, was, it was not much time. So we went with our bread and butter at the time. And it's a precious stone. And it was Ruby on Rails 2.3. So that's what in, went in, into production. And it kind of laid out like this. <clears throat> so there's 
three really external interface points here, the two on the far left, and then down on the bottom in gray is the those clinical informatics systems. Um, so at the top, the orders file drop. Would have been great to get those in real time, but as explained to us, the query was too expensive to do that at the time. So <laughs> three times a day, we got a drop of new orders for predict. Now, what that led to is cases where the lab gets a tube of blood, they scan the barcode on it. Oh, we don't know anything about this yet. So we would have to just capture, okay, we have a tube with this number on it, and sometime later they'll tell us who this belongs to, right? So that, that created, an, created an interesting situation. Uh, the next interface point is the genotype file drop, which that's when data comes off the instrument that actually does the genotyping, and the lab tech says, yes, the results on the instrument for the run as a whole look good. Let's process these results. And we pull those out to assign them to, the, to patients. And then, as I said, the, also at the bottom in gray, the, the clinical informatics piece was the third interface point. So in January 2011, we knew that there's got to be a better way to get orders. And indeed there is. And HL7, at the top left there, is a specialized flavor of EDI. Uh, many of you have probably had the pleasure of working with that in your careers. Um, so what we initially did was put a little Erlang listener up. There was a nice library that did what we needed in Erlang. So that's a little daemon that sits listening on a port on the network. Order comes in, parses it. And what we'd actually do initially was uh, parse it and then pass the data into the same Ruby script. But that presented a problem because the, the team that runs the HL7 messaging infrastructure really didn't care for the startup time on the Ruby script every time a message came in because that is, it was a synchronous call. So that created one of our challenges, which led us to here and the first appearance of closure in this infrastructure. So this is April 2012. Uh, the HL7 listener gets modified so that it just queues the data that is parsed into a RabbitMQ queue. And we have a new closure piece that consumes that queue and updates our database. That went well. Uh, and by this time, I've decided this closure thing is the way to go. So wh why would we leave Rails? Well, first, I'd, I'd seen the functional light. Um, now, that's not a great reason to sell, right? So we had to, it took more work to make this happen. But at, at bottom, there was a project incompatibility for us with Rails. Um, had to do with the short life cycle of Rails versions. Um, if you've used Rails for any length of time, you're going to get, seems like two, two and a half years out of a given version of, of its support lifetime. Uh, beyond that, there's, the Rails core team has a pretty liberal policy where deprecation is concerned, you may have seen. Um, and that falls out into extensive application changes to just to stay with the current Rails release. And that works for some people, for sure. And I'm, in saying this, I don't want to be critical of the Rails core team because they, you know, they need to guide the project like they see fit. But it, you know, I think in a lot of their use cases, they're using Rails to build a product that it, you know, it is what they're selling, Basecamp, whatever that is. Um, so every two or three years, they're fine with rewriting that system to, to stay current. In our environment, though, applications have to run a lot longer than that. Five, 10 years is common. Um, also, we have front-loaded budgets for development. Um, most of what we do is grant-funded. So the first two years, we'll have a lot of money for software development. And then after that, just you know, a tiny sliver of funds for maintenance. And finally, Clojure was also a better fit into the enterprise Java environment, which probably is where this application will land one day for its, its long-term support. 
Um, you know, the idea of enterprise, something's enterprise gets thrown around a lot, but in this case, I think uh, with Rails, it was just a problem for us that you know, we couldn't afford to make major changes to the system every two or three years just to, just to keep security patches in place, basically. So the decision was to rewrite, but not yet. Um, got buy-in from the project owners to do a rewrite. And it was clear now that it was time to do something. When I didn't tell you this, when I first walked into this lab in the summer of 2010 and asked them, where do you track what you've done with a given sample? Oh, and they turned around and there was literally a green accounting ledger book. So they've got, okay, we have this sample, this is the patient's name, the doctor that ordered it. I mean, every, they're handwriting in this ledger book everything about that sample to track its progress through the lab. Um, that worked prior to PREDICT because this lab was pretty low volume. But when PREDICT launched, we pushed about 12,000 samples through there in the first three years. So that just wasn't going to be workable for them. So it was time for us to get that workflow tracking into a system now. It was just something we wanted to do but couldn't do with the initial launch because of the short timeline. So we couldn't do the rewrite immediately because we needed to do this workflow tracking, get rid of the green ledger book. So one more time, Closure came to the rescue. We put in place a logbook service that is a, had a web service interface. So I, I didn't want to invest more in the Rails code. So I didn't want to, we had to make schema changes in order to accomplish this didn't want to make those changes to the Rails models. So we used a web service that would provide all the, you know, if, if they need to see, okay, what samples are awaiting DNA extraction, what needs to be plated, what needs uh, to be reviewed in QC, all those, all those views came from the web service. Also, any events like when they released results from a plate of genotypes, um, all those changes to be tracked on the, the sample's history went into a, a rabbit queue again and got handled by that logbook service. So at this stage, we had four distinct applications running as part of the system. Three languages, if you don't include JavaScript. And that led us to where we're heading now. Now, confession time. When I submitted this talk abstract, uh, there was a forward-looking statement. <clears throat> um, <laughs> it used a current or past tense phrase to describe this. This is actually going to be deployed next month or early January, depending on which maintenance window we can hit. Um, but this is the, now the, what will be the, the long-term predict application. So we still have the little piece of Erlang because it has performed very well. It's been very stable. Just no, just no reason to to monkey with it. It's also a much simpler library situation in Erlang than it would be to go to one of the Java libraries for HL7. They're, they're a lot more robust, but also a lot more complex. Um, so that's where the system will land. Now, I want to say something about a piece here. This container that it's running on top of, um, if you're running a closure server application and you, you can't articulate well why you're not running on this, I would just urge you to, to uh, take a look and look at a mutant. Um, you may be working a lot harder than you need to. Uh, and this week, Jim Crossley's here, Toby Crawley's here, Toby's talking on, fr on Saturday, I think. A um, couple of great guys. You'll, you won't find nicer people supporting software, more helpful to help you understand it. Um, beyond that, their IRC channel for a mutant, I can recommend just for the comedy. Um, so have a look at a mutant if you, you haven't already. So PREDICT is kind of, it's become a case for me of what I call round trip research. I think this is fairly unusual in people in a position like mine. Um, 
kind of back to the Warfarin story. I've worked on a number of research projects in my time in you know, the last 12 years. Most of them kind of fall into what would, could be kind of considered basic science. An investigator is asking a very narrow question. They find the answer, they publish it, and it kind of just ends. You know, downstream of that, sometime later, another investigator somewhere else, most likely, will be asking a question. They'll find that conclusion, and they'll build on top of it. But it's an agonizingly slow process to see something that's done in the lab or in a system that you wrote actually make a difference for someone in the healthcare setting. So in this case, for Warfarin, it made the trip all the way from it's a research question to now we're using the results of those research and it's, it's improving patients' care today. So, so that's been a really exciting and gratifying thing to be a part of. I mean, I, I had a minuscule role in, in that research thing at the beginning, but it's still an exciting thing to, to see that there's actual fruits of what we do. Um, So, you know, again, that's, that's not a unique case. Those, those advancements happen all the time, but people like me don't get the chance to be a part of them that frequently. So what are the challenges to predict going forward? Well, the first is a challenge that many, many, many projects have, obviously, funding. The first two plus years of this system, the institution actually underwrote the, the effort. This was a novel thing when we began doing it. Um, so there wasn't really precedent for insurance and others to, to pay for it. So the institution said, this is an, an important thing that needs to happen. We want to prove it. So more than 10,000 patients, I, I don't know the exact number, more than 10,000, the institution just ate the cost of you know, the lab supplies, the, the people, the software development, um, all those things. Now, in, in the current environment in healthcare uh, and also in, in research, is a, it's a challenging period because you've got you know, Affordable Care Act coming online, so there's a lot of question about what, what's going to be reimbursed and at what rate. You've got uh, sequestration, so all of these NIH-funded research efforts that are going on, that, that's a challenging environment now as well. So funding is a, a real and vital question at this point. Beyond that, it's, it's a moving target. When you're talking about drug gene interactions, new drugs come out all the time, right? They're, they're brought to market. And so all this investment in, say, warfarin, well, if you know, warfarin has these risks that we talked about, you know, you've, you've got to closely monitor the, the putting someone on warfarin. Well, if there's a drug that comes out that has a similar effect without some of those risks, you're going to move to that. So, you know, the work on PREDICT for a particular drug could lose its clinical relevance. Uh, so that's also a challenge. Finally, patient awareness and, awareness and acceptance. Um, some patients are really scared of genotyping. They want no part of anyone having their genotypes, having that in their medical record. You know, they're concerned about privacy. They, they just don't understand it. Others are, others are really excited about it, right? Hey, that's really cool. Let's do that. But for both of those groups, then the question comes at the end. Are they willing to pay for it? Um, when, when they're being billed for this service, you know, yes, it's improving their health care, but are they willing to, to bear that cost directly? So those are the challenges that we're facing. And this went a lot faster than it did in practice. So we have time for questions. Mm. Any questions? Yes. Uh, for which part? The first part, um, the, the first part was, let me just go back. So the first part was this, this HL7 consumer. That actually was built in about a week and a half, I think. Um, at that point, I had a little bit of experience with, with Erlang, so the, the functional paradigm wasn't new. 
I, w I certainly was no expert in closure at the time, still not, but um, it went very quickly. That's one thing I've really appreciated about closure is I've worked with it. Um, it took longer to, to get that moved into production because there were other hurdles, but the, the, the coding was very quick. Somebody down here? I see a hand. The most powerful thing that attracted me to closure. Um, one of my favorite things is when I look at the, the Ruby code base and compare that to the closure code base that's doing the same task and just how much less code there is. Um, that's one of my favorite things. Um, I like the fact that you know, in picking a, a stack here for this, you know, this, this is a web-based system or a browser-based system. You know, when you select a stack in Closure, you're, you have to have a pretty good awareness of what those pieces are and how they work, as opposed to Rails where you get a pretty, it's, it's not a monolithic piece of code, but it's a monolithic framework. You kind of, you know, generally people take it all. And uh, so that's been helpful, just knowing you know, how the, the internals work a lot more. Um, but Clo I mean, Closure's been a great fit for this to this point. Yes? Um, at the time we decided we were going to do work with Clojure, we, we had five developers on the team. Um, really, one other one really took it and ran with it. Another did some work in Clojure. We, we still have, uh, could consider legacy systems and rails that we're going to be supporting for a long, you know, as long as our teams are around, probably in some cases. Um, so not everybody picked it up and ran with it. Some decided they would prefer to keep working on other technologies. But does that answer your question? Okay. Mm. If, if I'm a single point of failure, you said? Um, well, I, I think actually it, compared to having it in Ruby, I think it brings it a little closer to the, the clinical informatics team's wheelhouse, if you will. They're, they're all Java. I'm, I'm sure that there's some closure uh, enthusiasts over there, if not practitioners. So, but it, it would have taken a really long time to move to to Java for us, so, yes? Would JRuby be a viable choice? Would JRuby be a viable choice? Um, that, that doesn't address the, the challenges that Rails brought in as far as you know, it, its life cycle of releases and things. You'd still be dependent on that, so, yes? No. Yeah. Yes? So I appreciate your comments about the volatility of Rails. I've seen the same problem in the federal space. How did you address any concern that you weren't going to run into the same kind of issues with um, closure or frameworks, whatever it is, and some of the in that space? The question wasn't really raised, honestly, by you, anyone facing the question. I. You know, what I've seen in the closure ecosystem is is kind of the opposite of that, frankly. Um, again, you know, it's a much more modular case for us. If if we needed to, you know, upgrade just one library for you know for security reasons or, or whatever, that was something we could do without near as much of a, a reach into our code base as the rail setting. Yes. The learning curve and buy-in. Um, the learning curve, I think, for so much of it comes down, I think, to the, the temperament of the developer. Um, developers who are just thirsty to to learn and you know like the challenge of, of taking on a new tool are are going to have an easier time, obviously, than someone who's 
just, just doing a job. Um, everybody I've seen personally who's taken the time to, to really get familiar with closure and understand the functional paradigm, I haven't seen anyone say, eh, it's not for me. So, um, but there is a learning curve. In, in my, my personal experience, I've tried to, to learn uh, Scala also, and I found that to be a much, much larger language to try to grasp. But, you know, I love some of the ideas there as well. But closure was a much simpler uh, challenge for me personally to pick up. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, we can do that kind of thing um, in general, but what we also have periods in the medical center where they essentially implement code freezes across the systems because of you know different events going on in the environment. So it may be that um, I think in September I think there was a two-week freeze, for instance, when they were bringing in a, a new staff of residents for the year. So they don't, they don't want anything to change in the environment while they're trying to do that. So, so we do have some restrictions like that because it's a clinical system. But in general, you know, we can make small you know, patches and fixes and things as needed. Uh, but this, this is a pretty big change that we'll be putting in here, obviously. Yes? The benefits of a mutant. Um, one would would certainly be for me the the, the Linekin plugin for a mutant. It makes deployment uh, much simpler than some other things. Um, obviously, the the pieces that it provides, the the abstraction that that's there. If you're running on a mutant in its current version, and it sounds like from talking to Toby, this may change wholesale in the next year or two, but you're running on top of JBoss, but you don't know you're on JBoss for the most part um, because they've, they've really put wrappers around everything. So you've got Hornet queue there, for instance, uh, that you can use for message queuing. You've got uh, you know, your, your web server pieces there. So we're not directly running Ring. Now we're using uh, a mutant's web server there. Um, in this particular environment, we're using RabbitMQ, and that we'll continue to use it some, but that's because of the, the Erlang client for it. I don't know that there's an Erlang client for uh, HornetQ. I think we'd have to go HTTP to do that, but um, it's, it's just been a, a simpler proposition than, than trying to run multiple applications, which is, you know, the current system, we're actually running multiple applications on the server closure applications. So I'm looking forward to getting that all into one contiguous deployment with a mutant. Okay. Thank you.